Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to this uh, presentation. Thanks to the organizers, the uh, Moscow Urban Forum, Strelka Institute, and all these sponsors for having me here. I've been asked to talk about my transition from architecture to urbanist, even though I still feel like, and I am an architect. Um, just to share the view from the global south and my experience making city from scarcity and how uh, the challenges of an urban and global, an urban world are the same for everyone despite the location or the places we've been working on. I come from Chile, South America, a country that has grown steadily fast over the last 30 years. We have reached a level of development that is putting us on the threshold of becoming a developed country, probably by the end of this decade, hopefully. And uh, we are about to get this great leap forward, but there's still many pending challenges. Challenges related to the environment, challenges related to how to bring the opportunities of the cities and that development to everyone in terms of equity, access to those opportunities through good transportation, housing, questions about safety, questions about resilience. And when I've been asked about how I became an urbanist or an architect involved in urban planning and design, I remember an advice I had when I was an architecture student in first year by Oriol Boigas, one of the founders of the rebirth of Barcelona in the early 80s. He gave a lecture when I was a student and he said that architecture was the most political of all professions. And I said, why? Is this an ideological thing or what? And what he was framing is that architecture is inevitable. And it not only affects the life of those who live and use the buildings we design, it affects us all. Because the effects of architecture are spread all over the polis, the city. That's the political aspect of architecture. And I didn't understand that up until understanding and sorting out the urban reality of many cities, particularly my own city, Santiago. This map shows the distribution of wealth in the city of Santiago, the darker red, the wealthier areas up to the uh, north eastern side of the city, and the pale yellow are the lowest uh, income families. And you can see that everyone is concentrated on one side. And when we start checking on the housing policies that were implemented during the dictatorship of Pinochet in the 80s, that were aimed to provide housing for the poor, eradicating slums. They also had some social engineering within it that was to take slums out of high income and central areas and bring poor people to the periphery so they could be isolated and have more social control. And this map shows how those families were displaced. So in a certain way, yes, they were eradicating slums and providing permanent housing, but on the other way, they were detaching people and gentrifying people, gentrif creating gentrification and eradicating those families from the opportunities that the city, the central city provided. And the surprising thing is that after we got back to democracy, the market system and the subsidy system that the government provided kept on pushing the poor out of the city. And this map shows where social housing was built through governmental subsidies over the last 25 years. And as you can see, it's far away from the center and very far away from where the opportunities are. Why am I telling this? Because also the quality of that housing was pretty bad. And as you can see, we ended up having ghettos of poverty, far away from opportunities, poorly served, without good infrastructure, and really increasing poverty rather than eradicating it. This is the kind of housing we have in Chile, far away from the center, completely detached from the opportunities without any quality of life, next to environmental hazards like those uh, pitches. You can see here this kind of like 
town, they have a main street that ends up in, 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 in nowhere to the right and completely detached from the city fabric. And on the other hand, the provision of public goods, let's say parks, libraries, schools, and so on, didn't follow the housing. This map shows the amount of square meters per capita of public green areas in Santiago. To the far right, up right, the wealthy areas, we have 20 square meters of parks per capita, and those are the wealthy people. To the uh, lower right, where about 1.5 million people live, most of them low income, we have 10 times less public space uh, available for the poor. Meaning that my son, Antonio, who lives in a house with a garden, who has access to a swimming pool and so on, he can go to a park three blocks from home. He can get to know those swans who are uh, an species about to be extinct. He can learn some civic values and he doesn't need them because he has access to education and so on. And at the same time, in the same city, there's another Antonio who lives in a small apartment whose family is going through a lot of struggle. And he plays with dead dogs in a vacant piece of land. That kind of inequity, it's a call for architects to get involved in policy, to get involved in planning. I mean, Chilean architecture has been way famous in terms of uh, single family design and homes and so on. But we have failed in terms of urbanism and architecture. So who took care of this emerging demands of these new lower income families that were turning into middle classes? Unfortunately, the retail sector. And as you can see, these blue dots are the shopping malls that began to colonize the periphery in Chile. And they became centers for entertainment. They became the public spaces. Take a look at the far left down there. Sports facilities in the mall. There, there's two, two public libraries in the mall. There's three galleries, public galleries of the National Museum of Arts. The National Ballet performed at the mall. There's a university campus at the mall because the government was way behind in terms of providing public goods, so the private sector took care of it. And it's not only in Santiago, but also in Concepcion, and now in the historic town of Castro in Chiloé, the mall is kind of like carrying the burden of all these new emerging demands. I'm not criticizing the private sector, but I'm saying that their goal is to increase sales. Their goal is not to fulfill the public needs, and we really need to catch up with it. Second idea, to learn from the beauty of the informal. When I was a student, I started analyzing a surprising uh, event that happened in 1999 in Santiago. This housing policy of providing access to a roof, even though it was in the periphery, was quite successful. And it stopped illegal taking of land, illegal, uh, the creation of illegal camps or, uh, or, or, or slums. And suddenly, in the middle of a wealthy uh, area of Santiago, one night, about 1,500 families moved and took over a piece of land in an amazing choreography. They knew exactly where to go, where to put their tent, and they created this amazing uh, kind of like instant city. And they started colonizing this piece of land because they didn't want to have access to a permanent house three hours away from where they were living or they were claiming to live. They didn't want to have a house uh, three hours away from their jobs, three hours away from the schools, three hours away from the good hospitals. They wanted to stay where they used to live, renting a room on someone else's house. So they built this camp, and they started negotiating with the electricity company to pay the bills. They wanted to pay the bills, and they had electricity, even though it was illegal. They negotiated with uh, a, a chemical bathroom company, so they got uh, a bathroom like a toilet every 10 families, and suddenly, boom, entrepreneurship came, video collapse. So uh, these people are poor not because they're lazy, they were poor because they didn't have access to opportunities, and this area in the city, well located, gave them opportunities. They started building the sewage system. They brought water into the camp. They had a kindergarten, and they were playing with the kids about to the right, the past, 
center present and the future of their community, they were willing to add value. And suddenly, in just five months, they were growing up the second floors. Look at their kind of like the recycle and the capacity of the informality of these families to really add value to that, even though they were poor. They were really asking for policies that could incorporate their capacities, their innovation, and their willingness to stay where they used to live instead of being displaced. When I was doing this research, there was this competition by the Japan Architect magazine called The Final House for the year 2000. And they were asking, what about the final house? And I said, hold on, how can you think about the final house when there's people that don't even have uh, an initial house? And I started thinking about this idea of how to incorporate progressive housing and started thinking on this kind of like framework that could really incorporate the capacity of the families to add value and consolidate it through their informal capacity of formalized their living. This was kind of like an exploration, but it led me to join forces with two great friends, Andres Jacobelli and Alejandro Aravena, and think about how can we bring these ideas to policy. And I remember that when Alejandro Aravena was invited to uh, be a professor at Harvard, we had a great conversation with him and Jacobelli. And Alejandro Aravena was so excited about the, the moment that Chilean architecture was living that he said, we should do an exhibition at MoMA about the, the great Chilean architecture. And Jacobelli, who was an engineer, he said, hold on. I mean, if Chilean architecture is so great, how come social housing is so poorly designed and so bad? I said, gosh, you got us. So we should get involved. And then we started thinking about how can we get architecture involved into policy making? How can we influence policy making? How can we fix the problems of that social housing policy that was really providing roof for the poor, but really taking them out of the opportunities of development. And that's when Elemental started. That was 2000, and we began thinking on how to improve the capacity of the Chilean government to provide housing and not, th and, and, and not think about housing as a car that loses value over time, but really think on the equation that could make social housing to gain value over time and become a step to get those families out of poverty. And why? Because if we scale it up, we can not even solve the housing shortage of Chile, but really scale it up to Latin America and the rest of the world. So the first thing we did was to set up a competition, an international housing competition. More than 700 entries from all over the world. There is Jacobelli to the far right, Aravena to the far uh, I'm sorry, to the far left, Aravena to the far right. I'm the fat guy next to Jacobelli, the second from the left. Uh, we had a great jury, Mendes da Rocha, Fernandez Galeano, Jorge Silveri, uh, Rafael Moneo. And while we were doing this competition, trying to bring capacity, trying to add value to the question of housing, we were called by the Chilean government to say, okay, guys, if you are so good at this, why don't you fix this problem? We had this a slum in the middle of the city of Iquique, 100 families living downtown. There's no housing scheme that could fit the 100 families in the same location, so try to think on a solution. And these families were happy about living downtown, but the problem is that there were, it was too dense, they have no infrastructure, but they didn't want to leave. So we started thinking on how through design we can create a neighborhood that could allow for harmonic growth, that could incorporate some standards in terms of uh, uh, acoustics and, 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 and structural, and everything within quite severe constraints in terms of budget, because the amount of money that the government has for paying for the land, infrastructure, and building the housing was not enough. So then we started playing with that idea and came with this scheme where instead of having high rise that families wouldn't like, we thought, okay, which units are the ones that can grow? Maybe the first floor and the top floor. So why don't we start overlapping them and interlocking them and creating some kind of like incremental house that we just grant them with the short amount of money, not a finished a small low income house, but half of an unfinished middle-income house, and we warranty all those aspects that they cannot do on their own, 
and then people add value on their own afterwards. We started working with the families. We started doing charrettes, trying to explain them how to do the expansions, what is yours, what is ours. We reduce the consumption of land in order to have at least five units where there used to be just two units. And this idea of having each family direct access to the street and create these patios and room for growth and personalization. And this is what we ended up having. This was day zero. This is what we expected to be day one. This is not fancy architecture. Beauty is not on the finishing rather than the process. And we dismantled the camp. And we built trust with the families. And while they were in the temporary camp, we were working with them, doing the charrettes, trying to understand and make them uh, understand where the expansion should go, where they shouldn't go. On the top roof, no, you have to go on the right side or the left side. And also start like working with expectations. And this is what happened. This is what they got, an unfinished house. But during the process, they were saving money. And once they moved, they started putting the tiles. There were two construction companies that started within the community, and they were specialized in additions to the houses. They painted, they furbished it, and just a few months afterwards, they started having the houses increased with more windows and all that style. At the same time, with the same amount of money in the same city, construction companies and just regular developers were doing this an hour away from the city center. And with the same money, we kept the families downtown and have them adding value to their homes and staying where they used to be. And that's the beauty of what we did in Elemental and what brought us uh, to become kind of like informing policy. We have been perfecting the model. I left Elemental in 2005, and now most of the credit is to Alejandro Ravenna and the team. But it's amazing how those ideas influence now the Chilean government. This is the camp I studied in 99, and the Chilean government ended up adapting the Elemental experience to regular housing subsidies. And those families stayed in that community. You can check on the, on the left side, high income houses next to the new housing, even though those were, weren't designed by Elemental. They were influenced by Elemental through the changes in policy that we did. And even President Bachelet to the left has been inaugurating some of the Elemental housing, not only in Santiago, but in the south of Chile, as well as in some of the wealthier areas of Santiago, where low income families are staying instead of being displaced. This is in Las Condes, uh, next to the Ferrari dealer in Chile. And this is Constitución right after the earthquake, when you can see that the model has been adapting and has been incrementing uh, value over time. So policy, politics, informality, and then infrastructure. How to integrate and share value between the natural and the built environment is another call for architects to really incorporate. And I was called in 2005, once I left Elemental, to participate in a master plan for uh, the urban regeneration of one of the most dilapidated areas of Santiago, the Aguada uh, River Park. Santiago has two main rivers, the Mapocho and the Maipo, who are the highest points in the Santiago Basin. But the lowest point of the Santiago Basin is this creek that is a seasonal stream. But whenever it rains, all the water flows down, and it creates this completely swampy land that has been taking over the city, but it's kind of like an open ditch. That's where, that's a picture of how it looks like now. That's where most of, of the slums have been located during uh, the mid 20th century. That's where the slaughterhouse is, that's where the jail is. That's that kind of like the, 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 the place where no one wants, uh, whatever you keep everything under the, the, the rug in Santiago. And suddenly, we realized that we need to upgrade that. And the problem was that it really floods. And it creates a lot of problems uh, whenever it rains. So the Ministry of Public Works was, th was thinking on how to canalize or do something in terms of hydraulic infrastructure. And the problem was that they did a tunnel, but the tunnel was built 50 years ago, and it didn't have enough capacity. So whenever the stream uh, increased, the water just ran through the city. 
So we started doing an analysis about the potential of that site in the middle of the city, and we said, gosh, we have a great opportunity not only to recover this, but to leverage that amount of money that the Ministry of Public Works is putting towards the hydraulic problem and turn this civil infrastructure into a civic space. This is what the Ministry of Public Works was thinking about, to invest more than $100 million in a second tunnel that would just get the water two days a year. And nothing would happen in the surface, and this place would stay as neglected as it was. Then came two great hydraulic engineers, and this is about collaboration. I mean, architects and urbanists are not stars that know everything. We integrate. And these two guys said, hold on. If this is just going to be working for two days a year, why don't you make a floating park? Why don't you design a park that is hydraulically designed in a way that during those two years, two days of the year, I'm sorry, whatever the capacity of the tunnel is fulfilled, it can run the water, it can be washed out, and then create value for the community. And that completely changed the equation. And it turned a hydraulic problem into a solution that would increment the amount of square meters of parks for the poorest areas of Santiago in an amazing way as you compare the green areas of the Mapocho River up in the north to the new areas that this park would, 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 would take. So then we started designing the master plan for this floating park. As uh, uh, Eva Castro was saying yesterday, this is kind of like blue infrastructure. And following on the concept that many other parks have done in Arizona and so on, trying to incorporate hydraulic infrastructure, but designed in a way that it could be used as uh, any playground. This is not a playground. This is a kinetic energy uh, reduction infrastructure. So we designed it in a way that it could be incorporated. And this is the, these are the early renderings. These are the images of the recovery of this whole area. And it was a quite sophisticated system because we had to keep the water in some retention ponds before it was brought back to the system again. I'm not going to uh, go that far. Uh, it was really a machine, a green and a blue machine, even though the water is great. Um, and we had to work with the community. Uh, learning the lessons from Elemental, we started working with the community, understanding what they wanted, what worked and what didn't work in the park. Uh, we, we, we proposed them some nice lagoons, and they said, no, don't, don't, don't bring permanent lagoons to the park. And we said, why? Because people will go there and wash their dogs, and there's going to be, oh, gosh, I didn't know that you, 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 you were worried about washing dogs. I mean, uh, there's a lot of cultural issues here, so they don't like washing dogs in the, in, the, in the park, and so on. So we learned from them, and these are some of the images published in the newspapers, and the park began to be built. And uh, this is kind of like the stage it is now. It's not open yet. Uh, the trees are still growing, but uh, chances are that the second phase of the park with all the greenery will be there. But at least you see that you're taking an opportunity of integrating infrastructure, but not for just the single point of view of engineers of reducing risk, rather than leveraging it and creating value out of it. Not all stories are great. You also have to learn from failure. And failure came from a disaster. In 2008, the small town of Chai Ten in the Chilean Patagonia suffered from the eruption of a pretty nearby volcano. It was a surprise. This volcano was inactive for more than 300 years. And it forced the community of about 5,000 people to evacuate in just two days. It was a massive a massive hazard. Here you can see the crater and how the dome is being created. And the key issue here is that this town has a strategic role in, in Chile because it is the gateway to Chile and Patagonia because of the fjords. You don't have a uh, connection through, through the mainland to the Chile and Patagonia. So the, the, this, this town was kind of like the gateway to half of the city. If you don't have a connection through uh, a ship or through uh, uh, an airstrip, the only way to access 
the rest of the country from the north is through Argentina. So it's a geopolitical issue. And here you can see the problem. The town is right below, and the volcano is to the left. You can see the, the smoke and the crater. And it was just four kilometers away on a straight line. So there was, I mean, what could we do? And the problem was not lava, but ashes. Ashes were accumulating, and the river clogged, and it rained and rained, and the river started trying to find its way through the city. More than a square kilometer of ashes were accumulating and started running through the town. And then I was appointed by President Bachelet as the head of the task force to do an analysis about the scenarios for either rebuilding or relocating this town. There is me in the middle with the team. And this is what we found. A ghost town with a volcano active right next to it. We ran a lot of studies. The town's infrastructure was completely destroyed. This is the main school there. And it was the heart and the center of the whole region. Most of the kids from the small towns in Patagonia, this is a quite isolated area, had to travel and live in boarding schools there for a month or, or a year uh, and then go back home. And all that infrastructure was destroyed and dilapidated. So it was a quite big challenge. And despite the challenge, these guys, these settlers, wanted to come back. They didn't want to leave. And this was the image of Chaitén before the volcano eruption. And we had this vision that it could become a sustainable gateway to Patagonia. The problem was that the volcano kept growing. And all the studies said that this was a danger area. And it was going to be very difficult to come back. The dome kept growing, and it was quite unstable. And the Ministry of Internal Affairs said, we really wanted the families to stay in town, but the task force said, you can't. They put the blame on the consultants always. Ah. And the reaction from the community was, OK, so if the Chilean government is not helping us, we're going to ask the Argentinians to help us. And this is kind of like tough for us. So I had to go there and face the community and tell them, you know what, you guys are facing a huge risk. And the risk is to have the dome collapsing and to have a pyroclastic flow going through the town and burning everything. A pyroclastic flow, it's a landslide that runs like uh, for more than 120 kilometers fast and with temperatures over 400 Celsius degrees. It burns everything on its way. And we showed this kind of like animations because we, couldn't, we weren't allowed by the government to show the real studies to the community. And they said, wow, well, ah, you're joking. You are such a whatever. Uh, they couldn't believe us. And one month after, it happened. Fortunately, the pyroclastic flow and the collapse of the dome was partial and not complete. And it stopped just 400 meters before the town. But it gave the Ministry of Interior Affairs the opportunity to say, the town is dead. It's time to move. So we started analyzing, OK, can we do some kind of infrastructure to keep the town there? And we could. But it would have been very expensive and scary to live there. It would have cost about like five times the, the amount of money to really build the town. So we started analyzing alternative locations with the help of Arab and their spear um, methodology. And we ended up running charrettes with the community, with experts. And we found that just four kilometers north of Chaiten, there was a perfect location that fulfilled all the uh, characteristics of safety. There was a place to build the new airstrip. There was a best place to build a new port. And it could become the gateway to Chaiten. We even designed a preliminary master plan that could also reply the quality of the existing town and really become kind of like an interesting place in the Patagonia to start over again, a sustainable town. There's some images and renderings of what it would happen. We gave this to the government, and the government started developing its own master plan. This is what we did preliminary, and this was the government's master plan. And they were going through it. They had the money and the budget to start implementing it, but time kept going. More than four years happened on the way, and the families were still displaced, and no brick was built, put on site in the new town. They ran a competition, beautiful renderings of the new 
town hall, sustainable, lead, and so on. This is the, the call for the competition. They started building the new airport, and then something bigger happened. February 27, 2010, we had this. We had the sixth largest earthquake ever recorded in humankind history. And even though the Japanese one was biggest in terms of intensity, the spread of the damage of the February 27, 2010 earthquake in Chile was massive. We're talking about more than 300,000 houses that were destroyed. It affected more than 20,000 cities towns and villages through more than six regions in the country. This map was done by a German agency and shows the, the displacement of the rupture of the fault during the earthquake. And you can see, I mean, it, it covered a range of more than 600 kilometers. It was massive. And it was followed by a huge tsunami. So those who survived the earthquake were inspecting the wave. This is the town of Dichado after the wave. This is our main road that is kind of like the backbone of the country. About 20,000 uh, housing units built by the government over the last 20 years were destroyed, uh, kind of like creating a backlash of four years in this goal of uh, guaranteeing access for permanent housing for everyone. Even new buildings collapsed. Coastal towns completely destroyed. Ports, fishermen wars. It was massive. Even Santiago, the capital city, suffered from the earthquake. This is the port of Talcahuano. And this was the postcard of Chile by its bicentennial of independence. Even the island of Juan Fernandez, that it's like three hours away by plane in the middle of the Pacific, suffered. They didn't feel the earthquake, so they didn't see the wave coming. We had, despite the massiveness, building codes in Chile are quite strict, so we had only 521 fatal losses. There's still 31 people missing, most of them from the tsunami. But about 370,000 homes destroyed 79 hospitals, many schools, many children out of school, bridges, towns, and about $30 billion of costs for reconstruction. And the diversity of the damage was huge because it was, it was not only building main towns, but also social housing, historic towns, fishermen wars. It was, it was a quite difficult task. And why did I say that the volcano story was a failure. Because I remember that we tried with the task force to convince the new administration, the Minister of Interior Affairs, to incorporate the reconstruction of Chaiten within the reconstruction plans for the earthquake. And he said, no way. We're not going to spend that amount of money in this small town when we have to reconstruct and rebuild the whole country. So let these people go back to town. And Chaiten now, it's a big failure. It is a ghost town with 800 people living in the town. The new airport is finished. This is a picture I took just a week ago. And the development of this new town is going to be just a strip development scattered all over the road from the ghost town to the airport. And the opportunity is going to be lost. So then comes the lessons from Chaiten. Resilience. How can you learn from your failures? President Piñera just came to office after the earthquake. And he appointed me as the National Reconstruction Coordinator for the earthquake, right after my failure in Chaitén. Can you imagine that? I'm the guy to the right side. And I said, I'm not going to let this happen again. We need to move fast. 
We need to bring certainty to the families. We need to start moving as fast as we can from the PowerPoint to the bricks and mortar. And we assembled a great team of people, the best that we had in Chile, the Elementals, the Arabs, everyone, and gathered together all the capacities to really take over this task of rebuilding those 222,000 homes that require government help and also fulfill the goal that the president set up that this should be done in four years. Just to imagine the complexity of this task, try to count down to 200,000 without making any mistake and multiply that by trying to find the families who are eligible for government help, try to set up that they have the papers and they own the land, try to find the project, try to get the money, try to get a contractor, bid for that, and have the technical capacity to follow up and warranty that that house is built in four years. That was the task, and it was humongous. So we did a plan. A plan that had different areas. On one hand, the reconstruction and repair of those homes, and also the attention to the emergency camps because we had a huge amount of families that were displaced, that were living in risk areas where the tsunami hit, and we had to provide te temporary and then permanent housing for them, and also all the urban reconstruction and infrastructure reconstruction. And it was a four-year plan that was trying to respect the willingness of the residents to belong and stay where they used to live as much as possible, learning from Chaiten, to regulate and plan considering the natural hazards and the mitigation uh, infrastructure necessary for resilience, try to keep historic heritage as much as possible, and try to enhance participation even though we were in an emergency process keep quality standards as the highest as possible, and work with the community and local authorities, more than 200 municipalities. And we had to be decentralized to really make it possible. The first thing when you're dealing with a disaster is that you have to manage expectations. And I love this phrase from a Harvard doctor who was helping out during the early days. She said, the government's disaster response was pretty remarkable for how quick and coordinated it was the problem with a disaster is that you're never going to be satisfied, even though you're doing a good job, because it is still a disaster. And we didn't have time to mourn. We didn't have time to really understand that everyone loses in a disaster. And once you realize your loss, then you can start building. And we had a lot of pressure. On one hand, our new president, a quite active guy, started saying that in 20 days, we have done more than the previous government did in 20 years, and it created a lot of tension. The Chilean kind of like humoristic political uh, newspaper started making jokes about uh, the goals and the expectations the president created, and it started bumping back even to us. This is the Christmas present that the clinic, that it's that humoristic newspaper, gave to the inhabitants of the destroyed areas. This is the Ministry of Housing to the right, and the National Urban Reconstruction Coordinator wrapped up for Christmas, and they gave them a baseball bat in order to hit us. I mean, can you imagine going to a community and facing them? Because you become, you become the enemy. People are waiting for you, not for help, but really for solutions, and right now. And the problem is that sometimes those solutions require sacrifice. And many of the coastal communities required infrastructure to reduce the tsunami risk. And that required expropriation. That required relocation. And it was hard for, for the families to understand that. And it really puts the planner and the architect in a difficult position because you have to negotiate. You have to communicate the difficulties and start building trust on people who are suffering already. And they transfer all their suffering to you. So it's not an easy task, as you can see from this picture. So we built on seven solutions for seven challenges. First, the emergency camps. Second, 
subsidies for home repairs, reconstruction of housing blocks, reconstruction in the owner's side. Many of the houses belonged to the people, so they were already on the sites. Resilient urban and waterfront reconstruction and historic heritage. I'm going to go fast because I'm running out of time. Emergency camps, more than 5,000 families were displaced and were relocated in emergency camps. Those camps have community facilities. They were meant to be there for just four years or less, and that was the goal, and we managed to fulfill that. So they all had uh, childcare areas, community areas. They all had uh, electricity and so on. It wasn't comfortable for those families, but we tried to move as fast as possible from the camp to the permanent housing, and we dismantled the camps because we didn't want those camps to become slums afterwards, and we did it. Then we created a special voucher card, like a credit card, and we made an agreement with all the, uh, the, 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 the home furnishing and, 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 and how do you say, um, well, um, the, well, the guys that sell construction uh, materials and stores and families that require repairs, they could go with a card, with a subsidized card, and exchange for bricks, exchange for materials so they could rebuild their homes. And we had an inspector checking that they're using the money for rebuilding and repairing their homes. And if it was okay, they get more money into the card. And that's how we got it. We began rebuilding and retrofitting existing housing blocks. And we had about 60,000 homes that would require to be rebuilt in the same owner's home. And and the same owner's site, sorry. And the problem is that the Chilean construction industry was used to this. They, want, they liked to have economies of scale and build huge projects of about 300 units far away from the city in land that they owned. And we didn't want that because it created gentrification. So we had to be innovative and force the construction companies to build houses that could be built in the same place where the families used to live in the central areas of the city. So we started fostering prefabrication that we didn't have that industry in Chile before. We made fairs so the families could go and pick the house they wanted from the subsidy they had, but then they went back home and the companies said, okay, I would love to build a house for you, but I'm not going to drive a thousand kilometers to build just one single home create some demand, get together with some friends, and I'll go there and build 100 homes. So we said, this is not working, and we organized demand. So we asked the families to get together with the subsidies. We called the construction companies to compete with the best designs and the best features they had for the same amount of money, and the families voted in a community assembly for the kind of house they wanted the more, and we opened the, the, the results, and then we granted that company to build the houses in that community. And that way, the system started working out pretty fast. In terms of heritage, we didn't want this to happen, and we started creating new subsidies also for historic areas with the special grants in order to keep and maintain the spirit of existing towns and not have prefab houses in existing towns. And also, we discovered that many families were living in someone else's house, and suddenly, once that house fell apart, those families didn't have where to live. So we had to build about 50,000 new homes for families that didn't have a home before the earthquake. At the end, the result was amazing. This is the Constitución scheme by Elemental. We did some urban renewal for inner cities as well, and then we move into resilience. How to do urban design in areas where you're exposed to risk? How can we manage to go back to the, to the sea, to bring fishermen back to the shores without the fear of another tsunami? What we did then was to restudy and reassess all the risk areas on the coastal line of Chile. And we defined three products. The risk studies, 
that defined, let's say, the red line, whatever the risk was uh, for a tsunami. Then, from that information, we started developing master plans and mitigation projects in order to reduce the risk areas to allow families and communities to go back to their towns without being displaced. And then we created special zoning and polygons for subsidies in order to build more expensive but tsunami resilient structures and homes. In terms of uh, the special subsidies, one of the problems that we had is that most of the houses that were built in these towns were light construction, so when the wave came, they navigated like boats, as you can see in the picture. So we started analyzing those houses that survived and also learning the lessons from Indonesia and some other tsunami areas and started defining some new codes for tsunami resilient homes. So you have the first floor elevated with uh, uh, concrete structures that are designed following the lines of the water, having the rooms on top, and so on. And we created new subsidies for that. This is the case of Dichato, one of the towns that was destroyed by, by the wave. This is what was uh, covered by the wave, the tsunami. This is what was left afterwards. And this was a fisherman's and summer kind of like uh, uh, town. Uh, very commercial, and um, we started doing hydrodynamic tsunami modeling to understand what kind of infrastructure we can bring in order to reduce the strength and the height of the wave if another tsunami happens. And from that information, we started designing infrastructure, but instead of building walls, we started building parks because the forest, along with the terrain, the topography, and the wave breakers bring a capacity to reduce the kinetic energy of the wave at a certain wave that you won't stop the wave, but it will go slower. And it will allow, if people have early warning, they can escape, it will go through the city, and then they can come back and clean their town. And it will become a park rather than a wall, and it will become a feature of the new town. So this is the master plan. We did 28 of these master plans in different locations and started moving as fast as we could from the project into implementation in order to, let's say, learn the lessons from Chaiten. And in just two years, this concept became reality. The fishermen start moving back to their homes next to the waterfront. And we even did high-rise buildings with vertical evacuation schemes where the first floor is where the boats are kept, and whenever the wave comes, it's washed out and the building stays steady. Same with the homes. And even downtown, the Chato that was destroyed, the main street, also the commercial life, the, 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 the normal life of the city was also part of the plan. And we refurbished the main boulevard so small shops and small businesses could start thriving again so this is the day after the, uh, the tsunami. This is the year after. This is the PowerPoint. And this is two years after. And this is now. And the people are back. And they are celebrating. And now they have a festival. And now they're happy. And the town is thriving. So in terms of urban planning reconstruction, we developed more than 25 master plans, 100 regeneration plans for inner towns, and more than 180 heritage recovery plans for historic towns in the inner parts of the country. By, the, by early 2014, we almost accomplished the goal. 199,000 of the homes were finished, and they're still pending some few because of some uh, difficulties that are related mostly with the construction companies and, and some things, but we can say that the reconstruction after the earthquake is already finished in terms of the homes and the urban reconstruction process, it's still going, but it's underway. All of the subsidies were granted. Almost all of the houses were finished. And as you can say, and as you can see, we move as fast as we could from the past into the intermediate and into the present. And as you can see, that house in the middle is not a nice house. It's not a great architectural feature. And when I, when I go to the owner of that old traditional 
uh, country house to the left. And I said, gosh, I mean, I don't like your permanent new house in the middle. It's kind of a, like small. It doesn't look as big and grandiose as your old house that fell on the earthquake. And this guy who was like 80 years old, he says, you know what? I don't mind. Because in that old house, I didn't have a bathroom. My wife has to walk 10 meters out to go to the bathroom. And here in the new house, I have heating, I have water, I have everything. And I know that with my own effort, in the next 10 years before I die, this little house in the middle will be as beautiful as the one on the left. And that's the beauty of the process. The beauty of the process is that, I mean, urban planning, design, is not for star architects, it is for the people. And as you can see, most of the studies that compare the process of Chile's reconstruction with the China, with New Zealand, Japan, the US, and Haiti, are setting up that it seems that we have learned these lessons in resilience. And even Chileans are evaluating the process quite positively. So just to finish, what are the main challenges? Not only in reconstruction, but in any process and urban project. Strength and opportunities for community involvement. Improve communication with the local governments. Support and empower local capacities. Trust on the people. Reconcile transparency with efficiency. You need to go fast, but you need to be transparent in terms of the standards and, and the compliance. Build common indicators. Keep the spirit of unity and political consensus as much as possible. And the main lessons, communicate the complexity of the task in order to manage expectations. If you don't communicate the complexity of the task, you're going to be lost. Involve and commit local leaders. If they don't feel like, like, that the project is theirs, they're going to go against you. Avoid displacement of population as much as possible. People live and they like to live where they are. Always incorporate participation or, or at least alternative solutions whenever possible. And promote solutions for urban resilience and regeneration and infrastructure. It's a great key for that. So incorporate risk reduction and mitigation works as social infrastructure. It's one of the ways to go forward. This is not a nice job. First, they will criticize how slow you're responding whenever you're dealing with a disaster. Then, once you move fast, they will claim the lack of transparency and participation. And at the end, they will dislike the aesthetics and the quality of the work. When that happens, you're done. Thank you very much. Do we have some time for questions? OK, two minutes. Since that I spoke too much. OK, there you go. I'm very impressed Okay, it's coming. One, two, one, two, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I was very impressed by your solution in Santiago. When you decided in the, in the downtown not to drill another tunnel, but to create a park, how you, how you decided, how you take, took that decision? What was the, the procedure of taking this decision? Well, um, we, we, the decision, I mean, we, we're not decision makers. We are designers. So the way we convinced decision makers to really move into this integrated uh, solution uh, wasn't easy. Um, and, and that tells a lot about the, the challenges for the profession. Chile has this system at, at the public investment uh, system where 
every public project has to go through a social and economic evaluation process. So for instance, if you want to build a highway or a hydraulic infrastructure project, it is evaluated and the one that gets funding is the one that gets the most benefits with the less investment. Why? Because we are a poor country and they want to really uh, be very efficient in terms of the use of money. And the problem is that the methodology they had for hydraulic infrastructure in place was based on the minimum damage. So whatever solution that ar arrives to uh, the less cost and reducing the damage of the flooding would get it. So for them, having a park on top of, 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 the, of the stream didn't add any value. And we said, OK, come on. I mean, there's a lot of social and economic benefits of having a park in a neglected part of the city. So while trying to convince them and while doing the designs in order to uh, make them understand that, that, that the project was feasible in terms of design and, and, and engineering, we, we, we worked two ways. Uh, we worked with engineers uh, developing, developing an alternative evaluation, integrated evaluation methodology that was then implemented and tested for the first time in this project. So the Ministry of, uh, at that moment it was called the Minister of Social Affairs, who was running all those evaluations, said, oh, this is a good idea, so let's try and test this new methodology that incorporated uh, green space, and, and, and infrastructure in the same package. And on the other hand, and that's, that's the beauty of, of, of getting architects involved in, in the economic analysis and, and working with engineers and with, with, with uh, specialists in, 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 in economics and, 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 and management, was that our solution was cheaper than the underground tunnel. So at the end, uh, the solution was cheaper and the benefits were higher. And that really convinced bureaucrats and politicians that this solution was much better. The problem is that it, it took longer to develop and it required a lot of coordination. And those were the main difficulties for this project because um, the timing for urban projects doesn't match uh, political timing. Because uh, in, in Chile, majors and governments last only four years. And this project took more than 10 years. So it was very hard to get commitment from bureaucrats and authorities to really get involved in a project that they, will, they probably won't be there for opening and getting the credit. So at the end, um, what I'm saying is that um, if you really want to have an impact if you really want to be an architect to, and be influential, um, you need to work with or manage uh, not only the design aspects, but also the procedural aspects. And those have to be with uh, economic analysis, engineering, social analysis, and involvement with the community. And then that's where participation and collaboration is key. And that's why I hate Star Architects, because the beauty of urbanism is that it's a collaborative work. Uh, I think we are running out of time. So OK, well, thank you very much for your patience and for your questions. <laughs>